everyone. Um, welcome to the BIA, acting director. Um, today, uh, we have one of our landmark events, the annual lecture, the Red Annual Lecture. And um, I hope you're going to enjoy it. So let me take this opportunity to welcome uh, the, 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 the presenter and the discussant, but I will not be introducing the presenter, because if I do, I will not be doing him justice. I will let uh, uh, Eost do it, because he knows him in person, and uh, he will be saying what he knows about him better than me. He was before... Up until, I think, 2016, you were a um, Mellon Senior Research Fellow at the Centre of Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape. And he still currently serves on the advisory board of the Journal of Southern African Studies and on the advisory board of Cronus, the Southern African uh, Histories Journal. But throughout all of this, he's also been a leading civic activist in Zimbabwe since the 1990s. He was a member of the founding task force of the National Constitutional Assembly, which was, in many respects, a precursor to then the MDC, the opposition movement. Um, and he was editor of the NCA Journal uh, Agenda from 1999 to 2001, and then the first chair of the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition from 2001 to 2003. Now these are very heavy, anyone who knows anything about Zimbabwe politics will recognize that these are very serious credentials in terms of civic activism. And being able to be right at the top of, of civic activism in this very, very difficult period, and at the same time be a leading scholar, I think is an incredible achievement, and for that alone I have great respect for Brian. Uh, since I've been in Nairobi, now as the suspended director, I've, I'm a little bit further away from Zimbabwe. I used to read Zimbabwean papers every day, now it's about once a week. I feel a little bit further away from it. So I'm particularly keen to hear what Brian has to say about recent events in Zimbabwe, which, which are really incredible. I mean, Zimbabwe and politics in Zimbabwe has once again surprised everybody. And so, Brian, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yus, for that introduction, and thank you to the Institute, to Freda, for the invitation to speak here. I, it's my first time at the Institute, but I'm very proud to be here and to be able to deliver this address. And thank you to all of you for coming. I think anybody who's been an analyst of Zimbabwean politics in the post-colonial period uh, will have been surprised by the events of 2000. Anyone who tells you they could have predicted that, I think they are telling a bit of a fib. Um, these events were the culmination, really, of a long-term factional battle within ZANU-PF between what was then the G40 group, which was the younger group around Grace Mugabe and former President uh, Mugabe, and the new President Munangagwa, which was known as the Lacoste faction. And in November of, of last year, uh, the, uh, uh, Munangagwa was expelled from the party. And uh, this triggered uh, a series of events in Zimbabwe. Uh, the, his, the factionalism is not new in ZANU-PF. Factionalism has been deeply embedded within that party since the days of the liberation struggle. But this particular factional battle uh, took place uh, within the context of the post-2014 um, uh, politics of ZANU-PF when the former Vice President Joyce Mujuru uh, was removed with the assistance of Munangagwa and the military intelligence. Uh, when Munangagwa was fired, he was fired for disloyalty, disrespect, deceitfulness and unreliability, that he had behaved in a manner inconsistent with his official duties. Once this happened, a series of events then followed. The defense commander, uh, the commander of the Zimbabwe Defense Forces, Konstantin Chiwenga, uh, sent out an, an ultimatum at a press conference surrounded by se 90 senior armed uh, uh, officers. The armed forces, he promised, are the major stockholders of the liberation struggle and would take corrective measures against counter-revolutionaries threatening ZANU-PF. So that this was seen as a step against a particular faction of ZANU-PF who, who felt to be criminal elements within, within that faction. 
This statement was then followed uh, a few days a day uh, on the 15th of November by a statement by the uh, Major General Sibu Cize Moyo. They have been taken over the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation and announced that there was a intervention on the behalf of the military to pacify a degenerating political uh, and social and economic situation. The position of both Chiwenga and Moyo uh, was re reiterated in a report by the mediation team which mediated the removal of Mugabe, uh, that this was in fact a military take, not a military takeover of the government, but a challenge or a challenge to the head of state, but instead was meant to prop up the authority of the president and buttress his constitutional roles. What was interesting about this intervention was that from the beginning, from the very beginning, the intervention was located within a language of constitutionalism. At no time was the, man, the, the word coup mentioned. In fact, this was a coup. This was a military intervention on behalf of one faction of ZANU-PF against another. But it was very, very skillfully done. And there were three aspects of this. As I said, first of all, the language of constitutionalism was continuously raised within, within the discussion. And this was never, uh, never in doubt by whoever spoke on behalf of the military. Uh, the second was that there was a, a massively, very carefully organized popular protest. And this protest drew on accumulate, years of accumulated anger, feelings of uh, betrayal, feelings of neglect on the part of the Zimbabwean citizenry. And so there was a massive turnout for this, uh, this march. Now I can just show you some of the, some of the pictures. This was the Mugabe Must Go uh, um, march. There was the uh, street name after Mugabe was thrown in the bin. This was the crowds in Harare, which uh, came out in support of the uh, intervention. As you can see also, all races were involved, massive crowds. And there was also kind of a romance with the military for the first time. This was the same military that had on various occasions in the 1980s in Matabililand, in the 2000s in elections, brutalized the Zimbabwean citizenry. But here, the citizenry came out in support of this intervention, not necessarily in support of a particular candidate of ZANU-PF, but because they wanted Mugabe out. There it is again. <laughs> um, and so, this intervention, as I said, the popular side of it was that they drew, they brought crowds out, and they were able to get a sense of a popular support for this military coup. Uh, the third was that then the the, the, the faction that uh, uh, provided the leadership for this intervention then went through certain constitutional measures within ZANU-PF. They took, they had a central committee meeting on the 19th of November and made several decisions. Uh, first of all, they expelled certain members of the G40, from, from President Mugabe, uh, his wife Grace, the Vice President, and various other ministers who were seen as key, including people like Jonathan Moyo. And these were uh, expelled from the party. The second was um, that they then uh, uh, stated that President uh, uh, Emerson Monangagwa would then be the president of the party and the, uh, uh, the, the one that would stand for elections in, in 2008. It was hoped that this process of constitutionalism within ZANU, this popular protest of people, would force Mugabe into a resignation. And on the Sunday night after that popular march, Mugabe came on TV and delivered somewhat of a surreal speech. Rather than resign, he indicated that he would be uh, presiding over the ZANU-PF Congress at the end of the year. Having not therefore done what was hoped, the, 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 the military intervention then went for the next step. ZANU went for the next step, which was to move towards impeachment within Parliament. 
And on the 21st of November, they set out to have this impeachment process carried out in Parliament. Mugabe was accused of allowing, uh, of usurping government functions, state resources, as well as ignoring all allegations of corruption and inappropriation of public funds. Mugabe was also charged with the inability to perform the functions of the office because of physical or mental incapacity. Before this came to Parliament, Mugabe's resignation letter came to the Speaker of Parliament. And formally, Mugabe had resigned. Uh, this was the, uh, some of the pictures of Mugabe watching the proceedings. And also someone, who, old comrade of his, who said farewell to him before the, before the end of the, of the proceedings. Um, the thing about the, to, to talk about here is that both the factions who were involved in this battle the both the G40 and the Lacoste, throughout this process, spoke the language of constitutionalism. They both claimed to be upholding the constitution. One in a kind of state of exception, moving in to stop a criminal element, the other accusing the, uh, the military of a coup and having abrogated the constitution. And so this was the same uh, people who had for years undermined the constitution in Zimbabwe throughout the post-colonial period, and particularly over the 2000s, now hanging on to this language of constitutionalism once again as they move forward. Um, and as I should say that this intervention by the military, of course, was seen by, was moved on because key members of the liberation struggle of the military were seen to be pushed out and on the verge of being pushed out. And I suspect also that this one, one there needs to do more work on, um, Mugabe had lost the war veterans. And the war veterans were key throughout the security structures of the Zimbabwean state for much of the 2000s. And, and that's what I'm saying, that the military, they've been at the center of ZANU politics for the entire post-colonial period, but not in the forefront. They were there uh, at the heart of ZANU's politics. The liberation struggle re rhetoric was the official narrative of the ZANU-PF, the legitimating narrative of ZANU-PF. The Joint Operations Command in, from the 2000s basically was very much the, uh, the, the directing force within ZANU-PF. So the military um, have really been at the center, but what happened here was the military came out to the front. ZANU always said politics rule the gun, but now that facade was gone. The military now for, at the forefront of Zimbabwe politics. What then was interesting was the role of SADC and the African Union. At first, both claimed constitutionality should prevail, that the constitutional principles of both the AU and, um, and SADC should prevail. However, very quickly, once the events unfolded, that, that changed. Part of the uh, slogans that were going on in the, in the, in the demonstration was SADC, stay out of it. The people of Zimbabwe were, at least the, those who were pushing this agenda, were asking SADC to stay out of it. But very quickly, once the change took over, the SADC message changed. And they then congratulated the military and the, uh, for this peaceful and disciplined takeover of power. All the discussion about constitutionality, all the discussion about sticking to the, against the coups simply went by the wayside, both on the part of the AU and SADC. It was clear also from reports that came out that certainly the South African government were being informed about what was going on. That's from the official statement of the, from the Zimbabwe government, uh, who said, thankful, said that Zuma was thankful that throughout the operation, the Zimbabwe Defense Forces Command kept briefing the SADF to a point that the SA government, through its defense arm, was always aware of what was happening. It's also clear that the Chinese obviously knew about this um, and that, uh, the, you know, that, that's another government that might have known about it. So this was not just a national event. This was an event which was prepared long ahead of time with certain kinds of consultations going on, I would say at both regional and international level. Once the new uh, regime took over, there was then another very interesting turn. 
in order to move away quickly from the shadow of the coup. The new discourse, the new narrative of the Munangagwa government changed. And there were several elements to it. One was the discussion of the economy was put at the center of the discussion. Uh, the politics, so Zanu's concern, you know, uh, 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 detailed concern with politics of the past was now said to be harming the government and the economy and that the economy now, eco production, production, production became the watchword of the new, sta of the new state. Uh, uh, Munangagwa said, we will not be able to accomplish much for as long as our sense of party work remains hidebound in the template of looking at ZANU-PF as about politics, politics, politics. No more. It's politics and economics. Let us recognize that the best emerge from the marketplace where livelihoods are made. Productivity at all levels must be religiously encouraged. The second element was re-engagement, international re-engagement. For since the early 2000s, Zimbabwe had been, has been under sanctions, both from the EU and from the US. And this, this uh, move towards re-engagement uh, became a new call from ZANU-PF who had been in this conflict relationship from the, for the West for nearly two decades. Uh, it should be said that uh, there was a lot of discussion in ZANU-PF that one of the key players in encouraging this re-engagement was the British government. And that the British government since then have been at the forefront of trying to push the re-engagement. So re-engagement became another key part of the narrative. The third was anti-corruption. That they were going after members particularly of the G40 group, their factional enemies, who they felt had been corrupt. They went after people like former Minister of Local Government, Ignatius Chombo. There's also now an investigation into Grace Mugabe's PhD, which was carried out under very interesting circumstances, to say the least. So there is now a case against that. Um, so what's, but what's clear is that it's a very selective <coughs> interpretation of anti-corruption. They're going after members of a certain faction. And this when, of course, some of the key people who have been named in the past for corruption are the very leaders of this coup. In the 2002 human, UN report on the, on the GRC, the people named for, uh, from the Zimbabwean side for pillaging and corruption are people like Munangagwa, Sibusi uh, Semoyo, and others in the military. We also know that the, the kind of theft and the problems that took place around the Chiagua, Chiazua diamonds and the lack of clarity about that involved the military, key members of the military. So that this again was very much a selective move on corruption, but one which also had resonated which with popular demands for some accountability within, within the government. Um, so that this, this kind of discourse, this kind of narrative, then began an attempt to normalize the politics of Zimbabwe. Normalize the discussion around constitutionalism, the economy, re-engagement, move away from the shadow of the coup, and move towards the coming election. There are of course challenges that this narrative will present to this regime. To introduce the language that they've, that they've spoken about here is the language of neoliberalism. The economic programs that they're looking at are neoliberal programs. In the past, in the 1990s, when the neoliberal structure adjustment program was introduced, it triggered the opposition politics in Zimbabwe. It's going to be very difficult to see how they can carry out certain kinds of reforms. For example, civil service reform, public sector cuts, without having a response from the public sector. The land, there are different gradations of, of class on the land who will be affected differently by any market reforms that take place. So that, and they're also part of the process that has taken place is that the, 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 the military have also purged certain elements of the, of the security sector. The CIOs, elements of them have been taken out, uh, elements of the police have been taken out. So there's also certain animosity within the military. It's not a unified structure. And that's something that's also going to be, have to be managed. For the opposition, 
this is a time of very, very uh, deep trouble. Because what has happened here, in changing the language of this, the government, this regime has in fact appropriated the language of the opposition. The, 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 the major uh, slogan of the, of the uh, MDC was Chinja Maitiru, which change your ways, change. They say, we've changed, Mugabe is gone. Neoliberal economic reforms, that's what we are doing. We're introducing a, a, a new kind of market reforms, re-engagement, we are re-engaging the West. Constitutionalism, we're speaking the language of constitutionalism. Kunangagwa uh, uh, has also promised a, uh, a free and fair election where he's inviting uh, international observers. And so that call, at least at the official level, seems to be uh, being taken up by the, by the uh, regime. So you have an opposition which has had its, the central parts of its, uh, 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 of its messaging taken away appropriated. And now the issue is, what do they say? Where do they go from here? The other challenge is, they've had problems, the opposition have had problems throughout their, their, to their history from 2000 in forming coalitions. Since the split in 2005, they had problems forming a coalition in 2008, again in 2013, and the problems now are still there within the opposition. And the, and, the, and the same issues have marred that process. Issues of positioning. Who gets what positioning in the leadership? Regional representation, and particularly on Matabele land. Who represents Matabele land? So these issues are also slowing down the process of, uh, of, of, of what's going on. And here, yeah, just again, if you look at some of these, that was the, when, the, when the coup took place, the opposition were also ambiguous about it. They, in fact, embraced it. They embraced it. Even though after that, they moved back a little, but they gave, their, uh, they gave their blessing to it at first. And so these, these are the kind of pictures of a solidarity between, on, around the coup. Um, uh, uh, to the new president also took it upon himself to visit Tsvangirai, to offer assistance in helping in the, with his treatment, and when he passed away, they once again made the very strategic step of saying, one of us has died. Now this is a very big step. This is the same regime which for a long time cast this man as a sellout. A Western puppet, not really a Zimbabwean. And who carried out massive attacks on his person. They gave him a stage, they offered to give him a state funeral as well and assisted with that. But this is the same man who they brutalized in the 2000s. And now very strategically have brought at least temporarily into a certain discourse of national belonging in the name of unity. So strategically they moved, I think, uh, very smartly around that issue. They knew, of course, Changirai's massive support. These are the crowds at his funeral. And uh, this is the, one of the problems, of course, now facing this opposition is that there is a battle for succession over who takes over from Tsvangirai. This is uh, the, the gentleman, Nelson Chamisa, who has appointed, been appointed, at least controversially, acting president. But there are now constitutional issues around his appointment. So that these divisions within the opposition, as well as the appropriation of the language of the opposition, has marred. Uh, the, has created huge obstacles now for the opposition as it heads into the 2018 election. One thing also is that the, the discourse of and the intervention of the military has also played into a global security discourse. That's the linkage of development and security, which since post-2011 uh, 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 has become the dominant discourse of security where the military play a stabilizing role. And therefore that discourse has been much more acceptable to the Western governments in the post-Mugabe era. They much, they've been much more willing to re-engage. The EU, they put a lot of money into the uh, electoral process, the BVR process. 
they don't have an alternative now to this. What, what, strategically, what do they do? They need this election to go forward. They need to see that their investments have been worth something. And provided, in my view, provided there's no overt violence as there was in 2008, they'll get, this will be accepted. Certainly, SADC and the AU will accept it. And I have no doubt that provided there's no overt violence and that the BVR process is reasonably okay, they're going to they're gonna get this election accepted. So strategically, again, that's another position that the, ops, the, the opposition have, have to face. For the U.S., uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the U.S. policy on anything is anymore. And certainly not on Zimbabwe. I don't know if the government of the, Mr. Trump knows where Zimbabwe is. But certainly my sense is that they will not move away from Zadera, which was the sanctions they introduced in the early 2000s. Geopolitically, Zimbabwe is insignificant to, South, to the U.S. It's not, it's not something Trump is going to push or Republicans are going to push. My sense is they're going to wait and see, and the EU will do the running on this issue in terms of re-engagement. And the U.S. will follow at some time at a later, at a later stage. So that as we, as we move forward, this is a, Zimbabwe is an interesting case of uh, basically how you can get away with a coup <laughs> and how you can, you can use multiple uh, strategies, popular, constitutional, party, intra-party, regional, continental, global discourses to push an agenda of one faction of ZANU-PF within another and make it seem as if it's for the national good. And so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, it's a lesson, it's a problem, and it's a challenge for Zimbabweans as they move forward. What's been interesting is to watch the comparison with South Africa over the last, the last week. Also a president who was reticent about moving out, but yet it was run very differently. No military involved. It was almost the totality of the body politic. It was parliament, it was civil society, it was the judiciary, and most significantly it was the internal processes of the ANC. In the end, Zuma was left with very little option but to step down, totally isolated by those processes. So there are very interesting comparisons with Zimbabwe and South Africa, same region, different interventions, and partly because in South Africa the military did not play the same, they had the same centrality in the, in the ANC as ZANU, Z, ZANLA had in, in, in ZANU. That within South Africa, other internal forces were in some ways even more important in the battle for democratization and the change in 1994. So those kind of dynamics changed. Also the center of power in the ANC is much more diffuse, so you're able to get much more uh, different forms of accountability. So there are different things taking place in the region. Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, we see what's going on in Angola, new president, uh, but of the same party. Um, so uh, as, a, as a region, there are very interesting comparisons that can be made. But uh, just to say that in the end, what I wanted to do here was just to give you some sense of the dynamics behind the intervention in November, the politics behind it, the rationale, the regional, global, and continental factors at play, and to say that any democratic movements on our continent, including in Kenya, have faced massive tasks of change. Massive tasks of what messaging, how they deal with regional issues, how they deal with ethnic issues, how they deal with building coalitions, that there's a lot to be learned out of the experiences of Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Okay, Brian, thank you so much. And also for being so succinct, we've got loads of times for discussion and question, which is, is very good. Now I'm supposed to be a discussant, but I'm just gonna ask a few questions and see how we go, and then we'll open up to the floor. I know there'll be loads of, loads of questions. And I, I wrote a few questions down here, and I'm just trying to find them at the moment. Um, a couple of different things. I mean, f first of all, I mean, this language of constitutionalism, 
which I think is really stark and very interesting. And and you made the point that this is kind of a change from ZANU-PF, who which has kind of ignored constitutionalism for a long time. But I want to push you a bit harder on this because it strikes me that certainly Robert Mugabe is a very clever actor, and did he not always try and legalize whatever he did? And actually, you know, I know the Commonwealths talk about uh, lawfare, for example, and and. And in a very different context, South African context. But it seems to me that Mugabe's been doing lawfare for a very long time. And uh, although throughout the 2000s, yes, there were these moments when the constitution was all but abandoned and there were loads of extra constitutional things going on politically, there was always quite a careful effort to bring them back within the, the, the language and practice of law in some way. And therefore, you know, to what extent have these actors in Zanopia you know, these, this new regime really learnt from Mugabe in that way. So that was kind of the first thing that that's, I'm going to, I've got a couple more. Um, yeah, I mean, and this relates to the next question, which is, you know, again, they're very smart. They, the way you presented the way in which they've taken on the language that the opposition uses, the language of neoliberal reform, the language of anti-corruption, the language of, of free elections, etc., 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 the language of the economy and so on. And, and this is interesting because it's always struck me that through the 2000s, the opposition was never able to control the political space because they never had anything to say about land. And so Zanapiev was always able to very quickly uh, sideline whatever the opposition said by saying, well, we we're about land and, and they control the political space in a very powerful way and now they've done this remarkable switch so I guess what I'm getting at to here is you know there was a time not that long ago everyone predicted that ZANU-PF was going to collapse when Mugabe died and everyone was thinking right nothing's going to happen in Zimbabwe until Mugabe dies and when Mugabe dies ZANU-PF will just be fractured in a way that Kano is kind of not really a very big player in Kenyan politics, for example. But this, something else has happened now. And so I'd like to push you on the long-term prospects of ZANU as an organization. Is this a typical thing that actually if we look at the history of ZANU, ZANU has always gone through these moments, these purges. And if you go back to the history of the liberation struggle, there are these intense purges and it rebuilds itself out of it. So is, is, Zanu, is Zanu the big survivor? And in that sense, is Mugabe done what he's all... Is Zanu meant a lot to Mugabe? And I wonder whether in the long term he may, or someone thinking like him may reflect that Mugabe's done well because Zanu has survived. And then my, fast, my last kind of comment here is, is just one of personal curiosity. Because as you've laid it out, it's a very smart coup. It's incredibly smart. How did they manage to do this without Rob Mugabe knowing? Because Robert Mugabe had, you know, the CIO and his branches of the CIO were everywhere. And how did they do this without him knowing beforehand, without anyone knowing? I think that's enough questions for you now, Brian. Thank you. you are, you're absolutely right about the language of constitutionalism. Um, ZANU has been very careful about always legalizing what it does, but it's always selectively applied the Constitution. Either selectively applied it or change it post facto, a particular intervention in the politics. Um, and so that language has always been there and they definitely learnt from, from Mugabe around that. But they also knew that both the AU and SADC would not, they, they'd have to sell it as a constitutional move rather than a coup. So that was very important to the intervention. Um, the fighting of opposition space. Look, I think that up until the, the referendum in 2000, the, the civics and the opposition dominated the political space in, in Zimbabwe. The, the narrative was pushed by the opposition and the civics. To, to, in order to stop that, once the land occupations began and the fast track, that changed the dynamics completely. And the, the, even the discourse, they now went on the offensive and the opposition had no serious response to that. It remained constitutionalism, free and fair elections, re-engagement, but at the time, the dominant narrative was radical redistribution, the, the, uh, dealing with the colonial legacy, anti-imperialism, pan-Africanism, all issues we'd had, which had a broader resonance on the continent and even internationally. They spoke to a certain critique of, of Western interventions and a certain double standards of, West, of the West around democratic issues. And that the opposition were not able to respond to. 
I would say that yes, Zanu has survived a lot of crises, and in many ways, Mugabe's legacy uh, uh, may well be that the, the continuity of Zanu, precisely that. Uh, and they have been very careful, the coup leaders, to say, we're not against the president. We are protecting his legacy from the criminality around him. And so they see this as a continuum of the Mugabe legacy. Not a contradiction of it, but a continuum. And that's how they will continue to construct it. And so in the narratives that come, it will never be that we uh, replaced our founding father. We protected him from criminal elements in order to uh, perpetuate his legacy. That will be the narrative, I'm sure of it. And, uh, and so, um, you know, the, the, the future memorialization of Mugabe will grow. As an as a, as a, as a icon within the iconography of the state, within the uh, messaging of the future, Mugabe will still retain a central role. I have no doubt about that. Um, how did this take place? That question I can't answer yet. I would like to know that myself. Because clearly, I mean, and you get different messagings. Uh, Chris Mutsanga, the head of the war veterans, said to, uh, publicly that they didn't even tell Munangagwa what they were doing. So that the war veterans are claiming that they're the ones who pushed this and planned it. And they didn't tell Munangagwa what they were doing. Because of their fears of what was going on within the state. So it's clear that there's a lot more we don't know about how this happened. And I think in the future that's where we would really need to do some serious research and ask some serious questions. Yeah. I'm ready to, I've got more things, but Brian and I already talked for like three hours last night, so I don't know this conversation. I'm going to open up to the floor and I might jump back in later. Oh, your hand came up first, sir. Is there a roving mic? Yeah. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, the presenter and the discussant. Um, my name is Charles Kamala. Um, I followed with a lot of interest and obviously there are parallels uh, across the continent but I would be worried about uh, your definition of what a coup is because a coup is a, a change in the constitution in a radical manner that is, does not contemplate, in other words a revolution. But if Mugabe stepped aside and he resigned, that is a legitimate way of it's a contemplated way of transfer of power. So that um, what the world has frowned on in the 21st century is recognizing uh, uh, you know, military coups. And I think we remain consistent in that position, including the, what happened in South Africa, what happened in Zimbabwe. It's different from what was purporting to happen in the Gambia when uh, ECOWAS has to politely tell uh, Yaya Jame, look, uh, we don't recognize illegitimate takeovers. And so I, I think you can be happy about uh, a constitutional uh, uh, transfer of power. Um, I don't, might not have been neat and tidy in terms of a planned uh, election, but, uh, and South Africa, the same thing. Uh, um, that is an acceptable way of, of, of transferring power. Uh, with, uh, otherwise, you're stretching words if you, if you, if you call it a coup. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, so I have a, a question pertaining to women, um, the role of women in the political discourse. Um, you had during the coup a lot of language um, as you rightly pointed out about uh, upholding the legacy of Mugabe uh, but then there was a complete demonization of Grace Mugabe um, and it almost seemed like Grace Mugabe was ten times worse than Mugabe in the way that she was portrayed. Um, you also had an issue where there had been a, a vice presidential seat that had been uh, reserved for women that, that is no longer there. 
uh, in the opposition, you still have the same issues of a woman who was also placed as uh, vice president but is, is now being uh, removed from the position and someone else being, um, yeah. So you had uh, in the 90s a, a great group of women who were always at the forefront of politics and now it seems that uh, they've sort of been silenced in, uh, in favor of this male um, army. Yeah, so I guess that's the question. Why, where do you see the role of women in politics going? Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Franklin. I have a question about the future role or the influence of the Zimbabwe diaspora in the future politics. And I'd like you to expound a bit more on the influence of the ZDF, particularly in the, what's left of the commercial sector, including weapons industries, military uh, services and the like, the influence of the ZDF in Zimbabwe's foreign policy. And perhaps you could explain a bit more about how, why the ZDF, as an outgrowth of liberation armies, came to embody the political party as well. In other words, that if the military goes in tanks into the streets of Harare, but the party and the military have become very similar in outlook, whether it was to the fore or behind the scenes, you know, that we, get, we, don't want to need, we don't need to get very technical about whether you need to shoot your way into power. Thank you. Uh, Charles, you're on the court. According to the Zimbabwe Constitution, the only individual that can order the army onto the street is the president did not do that. The army came onto the streets not on the constitutional order of the president, but ended up removing that president. And they removed it to all the processes that I, that I mentioned. Taking over the the Z, you have the tanks on the streets of Harare. You have the ability uh, coming on to the. We are removing those criminal elements in the name of the constitution without consulting the president. I call this a coup. <laughs> I call this a coup. Um, and that, but I said the way the manner it was done was very skill free. That, that's what I try to. The second human question, very important. Um, you're right that the vice president issue is no longer there. The, the biggest abuses recently of women have been in the opposition. Uh, at uh, Morgan Tsangirai's funeral, the vice president, Kupe, was attacked, was threatened and attacked at the funeral. And not just attacked in the name of, as a woman, but as a member of a particular tribal group within Zimbabwe. A minority. The language around Grace Mugabe was extremely misogynistic. She was classed as, you know, the, the evil one behind the throne. And whatever, uh, whatever she did, she was placed at the center of that operation. Uh, and I think that was very, again, deliberately done in a kind of patriarchal narrative that resonates through other sections of society. And again, that was very strongly part of the of their narrative, but with huge long-term effects for the politics, not only also of the opposition. And it's been very disturbing to see the opposition conducting a kind of politics which in some ways mirrors the politics that they have fought against for so long. The, 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 the ugly succession battle where constitutionality has not been followed, the internal violence that's, that's been taking place. These are all things that the opposition has critiqued in the past and have now been, become deeply embedded within the opposition itself. And that is very, very worrying as we move forward. It's, it's a challenge that the opposition are going to have to face if they want to regain any kind of ethical political superiority on the political terrain. I think that uh, one of the first things that Munangawa did was to engage the particularly the business groupings. 
because he's a way of bringing I'm sure that's going to be a strategy that will be pursued. The big challenge will be whether they will allow the diaspora the right to go into That's coming up the uh, Constitutional Court. It has been presented to the Constitutional Court. Does India have played a role in the Zimbabwe economy? I would say, particularly since the DRC intervention and the land. In the DRC, as the UNDP 2002 report, there was a lot of pillaging of resources, which those resources, no one knows where they are. But they involve the military. The Chiazwa diamonds in 2009. Uh, the figure of 15 billion has been put there. I don't know where it comes from, but the point is there's a lot of money which people don't know where it went, and the military wants to get involved. In terms of rapid accumulation, which have been the main benefits of that rapid accumulation, whether it was in DRC or Chiazwa, and also many of the key multiple ones, there are serious pieces of land in the land uh, redistribution. Industries that are little set up by the North Koreans, and for the Al Qaeda, they sell weapons in India. I don't, I don't know too much about that, so I couldn't answer. Um, the party has always been completed. Always, from the liberation. Remember, it was the army, the, the military commanders who brought Mugabe in in the late 70s when he came out of prison. Uh, people like uh, Nongo, Tongo Gara. These were people who brought him to the forefront and to the leadership. They removed Dabaningi uh, Sitole, brought him in, and then throughout the 80s, the military were key to the suppression of the opposition Zapu in Matabila, in the Gukaraunde massacres. In the 2000s, they were central to the suppression of the opposition. So that conflation, and they were also appointed in key posts within the state including the electoral bodies. And one of the first two things that Nangagwa did was to appoint military figures in his cabinet. The Vice President, Chiwenga, former Commander of the Chief Armed Forces. Sibu Sise Moyo, he's now the Foreign Affairs Minister. So that the, uh, the army are at the forefront. And uh, this statement is now that we, the military, are the arbiters of who rules Zimbabwe. We will decide. Who rules Zimbabwe? We have decided in 2008 Mugabe lost an election. Clearly, even Sadat would recognize this position. So the military stopped the opposition from taking power. So I should be in power in 2008. But the military prevented massive violence was introduced in 2008 and people so that uh, uh, conflation of army and, and party is central. Here it is. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, Loads of hands coming up now. I've dwelt a lot on this side of the room. I'll come back to you. I see a hand up. Zimbabwean people forgotten Gukurahandi massacre, uh, so that uh, with the coming election, what is Nagagwa and the military uh, going to tell the Zimbabweans, or they'll just uh, forget? Please. 
Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, could you please explain, you talked about international involvement, uh, specifically the Chinese. Could you expand on that, if you can? And what exactly happens to people below 30 now? That the reference point, I guess, from Mugabe is gone. What kind of narrative are both the opposition and the ruling party speaking to that whole uh, grouping of people? About land, but land was one of the big problems in Zimbabwe, and it certainly is a big problem in this country and probably throughout the whole of Africa. There was some suggestion in the newspapers that possibly some of the land in this farm might now be returned and properly farmed. Why was why was not the effect of I think precisely because the faction was that was between Munangagwa and Mut and at that stage already uh, in the, the military in my view uh were behind Munangagwa because the, the military intelligence was central to helping to remove Tujo and the research that has been done that. The, uh, Maduro had support from the CIO. The Oxford scholar Miles Tandy has done very useful work on this, showing that one part of the state security supported Maduro, the central intelligence, the other, the military intelligence, supported him. And they were the key to, to removing Maduro in 2014. Once that same power structure came under attack by the G40 group, at that point, they moved against Mugabe and the G40. The question of Bukharone is also an interesting question. Under the Constitution of 2013, there is an allocation for a National Peace and Reconciliation Commission. That could be supposed to last for 10 years, uh, five years of it have never really passed. The commissioners were appointed this year uh, by the Munangagwa uh, government and they began the, uh, they began the uh, meetings in different parts of the, of the country. They this week held meetings in Madhubiraland where the meeting couldn't even take place because the people refused to listen to the commissioners. Because they said these are most, this commission is dominated by Shona people there's only one person from Madrid and here, and we refuse to listen. Um, I think the, the, the regime hopes that by putting this process at the forefront of its initiatives, they could control the narrative. I don't think that's going to happen. I think there's too much there that has not been said, has not been done. I think it's going to be one of the big areas of controversy. Huge. It's not going away at all. The Chinese thing, my, I, I alluded to that because it seems to me he has reported to Wayne before he came back. It's highly unlikely that he not have informed the Chinese of what was going on. Highly unlikely. The Eastern and West, uh, if it goes, we can begin some kind of even for the Chinese who have worried about the non-payment of debt back to them. Okay. Yes. And one of the Chinese policies in Africa is delocalization, where they uh, produce their goods in countries at lower cost. These goods then get exported to countries in the West. Zimbabwe would be a very good place for that to happen. It has the infrastructure, it has the human resources, so that that strategy of China could work in a country which had a new re-engagement with the West. So there's very clear strategic interest also, I think, 
involved in the Chinese uh, quietness over this, and in fact, quiet support for the group. The policy is very key. Even before Mugabe was removed, his mission was, was, was hitting the youth. His, his rallies were talking to the youth. Um, and what's happened in the MDC, and uh, one of the reasons why Chamisa is to the fore, is precisely because of that. He's young, he speaks to a youth vote, and in the next election this is going to be key in terms of the demographics of the voting. What they can offer the youth is another, is another question. But the political campaigning is certainly going towards the youth. And I would think that's where it's going to be in the coming months. The youth have too often been used, both by ZANU and in the MDC, as foot soldiers in the violence. Inter-party violence or violence between parties. They've been used like that since the early 2000s. Many of them now are much more critical of that and they want to see much more substantive changes within the economy. So, I think this voice vote is going to be very important in this election. The land. One of the first messages that came out of the new president at his inaugural speech was that there would be a conversation for the land, but according to the law. It was going to consider means for improvements on the land taking the land itself. One of the things I think is likely to happen is this is where the British government might come in to assist with this new regime. Is to give assistance on how to deal with the land question and to try and move the business forward. I suspect that's where the British diplomacy is going to go in terms of the engagement in the coming months. Uh, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much for your excellent lecture. Uh, with the new Zanu PF government uh, seeking to re engage the West and not mark the coin, how do you think that sectors? So, in the 90s, to an extent, the health and education systems were quite good, some of the best in Africa. Is there anything that could bring about a resurgence? Are you hopeful and optimistic in that regard? Secondly, in terms of immigration flows, places like Chirundu, Mashvingo, um, Bait Bridge, and so on. Southern Zimbabweans have been streaming across the border for decades now. Do you think that there might be a change in those migration flows in the coming years, depending on livelihood support and economic uh, incentives and business and job creation and business opportunities that may arise as a result? What do you think are the most promising developments that you would anticipate might come about as a result of the new leadership? under the model of the and the 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 and the 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 broadening of civil and political uh, freedoms. Do you think that with the new regime, it will broaden the civil and political rights uh, apart from uh, regular elections uh, because uh, the new regime is focusing on development of, from the scope of economic uh, empowerment and economic uh, liberalization, but I think that also freedoms are part of development and they should go hand in hand. My second question is, you have mentioned uh, the thing about uh, security and stability, that uh, right now it seems like the world is um, accepting of such a military intervention as long as it fathers or it fosters stability in such a country post 9-11 because of this whole terrorist thing. And I think that Africa is falling prey to the same thing that used to happen in the Cold War, that the West would uh, accept and even support authorit authoritarian uh, regimes as long as they were against the Soviets. And right now it seems like that's the, the narrative is with regards to if you can support us in the fight against terrorism, then we will give you support and we will recognize you. So what is 
because this is a broader question uh, focusing not only on in Zimbabwe but across Africa what is the place of security uh, post 9-11 and military interventions hello I want to talk about um, economics um, I've always been a bit puzzled because um, apart from the Eurozone countries, I think Zimbabwe is the only one which doesn't have a sovereign currency. Is this important to the new government? Does it have any significance in the country that they're using the US dollar for all their transactions? Um, yes, if you could comment on that. Brian. I think the neoliberal reforms go as the government claims it will. There's going to be a problem in the health and education sector. Unless the, the assistance from outside, the humanitarian aid assistance, is pushed into those areas. Much, the US pushes a lot of money of humanitarian aid into Zimbabwe. It's one of the highest uh, of the West, even despite all these issues of the, of the 2000s. So one of the things that might happen is that assistance might continue to go into those areas, depending on what the negotiated re-engagement implies. But if not, there's going to be a problem. Uh, migration flows. My sense is that uh, people in the diaspora, and especially in South Africa, are playing a wait-and-see game now. They're not going to rush back to Zimbabwe if there's no jobs. Many of these have to send remittances to their families to survive. They're not going to stop that. I think the most, what you will more likely to see is the business groupings in the diaspora moving in. That you'll see before the more uh, popular uh, change of movement. Um, and that, uh, that I think the, this regime is actively pursuing. And I think that's where you like to see them. Most promising areas. Look, I think they, they've put a lot at stake around the economy. They've got to deliver something on the economy. This goodwill that they have won't last forever. There's a sense of let's give them a chance. We're tired, we've been abused, we've been beaten, imprisoned, killed. If he's promising this, a promising uh, to move the economy forward, there may be people who say let's give him the benefit of the doubt. But that, will be, that honeymoon period won't last for long. And that comes to the currency. They have to move very quickly around getting the currency going because at the moment uh, people are still lining up outside ATMs for hours on end. And this is causing huge family problems and problems just of stability within families. For the moment they're going to stay with the bond because they, they can't afford to introduce a new currency when the production levels are so low. There's nothing to back it. Nothing. You know, Zimbabwe in the, eight, in the 1980s, the informal sector, according to the Riddell report, could be measured in tens of thousands. The, the 2015 Zimstat official figures are 94% of the Zimbabwe population now works in the informal sector. That's a massive reconfiguration of a social formation. One where you had a strong formal sector modernist famous framework of trajectory of development. It's not there anymore. It's one of the reasons why the opposition is weak. is because the trade union movement, which was the heart of the opposition, has been decimated. There are no formal sector workers. The main formal sector workers are in the public sector. And those fall under the, st the, st the state. And they also, the state has also introduced certain patronage networks for public sector workers. Housing, land. So they're keeping a close eye. They've also divided trade unions. ZANU-PF unions are the more independent unions. So that this question of the economy and the currency, the production levels, until those begin to move, they're not going to be able to introduce any of their own currency. Which means that they're going to be subject to all the vagaries of not having their own currency, which means they can't really plan. The central bank, one of the central functions of the central bank is not there. Uh, the, 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 the bond notes are, are becoming more and more useless. So it's a major issue for this and for any regime that comes into power. 
Um, civil political rights. I think that this is absolutely key, which is why it's so important that an opposition and the civic movement stay in place. Because my sense is once this election is over, you could see a change of tolerance levels within Zimbabwe. They won't move on civil and, and, and political liberties. I don't think they will. They haven't moved on electoral reform. Under the global political agreement, there were key elements of electoral reform which were supposed to take place. They never did. SADC still recognized that election. To date, there's been no serious electoral reform. The only thing they've introduced is the, uh, the biometric voter registration. That's all. No reforms around the media, nothing around the security sector, uh, uh, nothing around the opening up of, of public media spaces, nothing. So that I don't think they're going to move, and the only way they will move on that is if there's a strong civic and political opposition. That's the only way. Zanu, what people don't realize is how much the opposition has changed the political discourse in Zimbabwe. The fact that ZANU is now appropriating the language of the opposition says something about what has happened. The fact that we have a new constitution is mainly because of the opposition and the civic movement. The fact that the rights debate is so still central is because of what the opposition have done. They've changed the political landscape. They may not have been in power, state power, but they've changed the landscape. And that's something people are already beginning to forget. Just how much they've done to change the politics of Zimbabwe. Uh, stability. Uh, as I said, the question of stability is it's, it's becoming so pervasive on the continent. Uh, someone like Mr. Denny can get away with what he does because of his particular role in the, in the, in the, in the anti-terror campaign. What's happened in Egypt in the, in, 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 after the, the Arab Spring speaks to those issues as well. Um, West African states who are in dire states but are key to that global security issue. I think that the stability messaging is going to be probably the biggest obstacle for democratization discourses in the coming years. And it's something that the opposition are going to have to learn how to articulate it, how to respond to it, and how to mobilize around it. And I think it's a big challenge. I think I think the, what, the next round should be the last round because we've got drinks and stuff. And I see loads of hands. I'm going to ask one question and then I will invite two more people to ask questions. But I like, Brian, that the fact that you've kind of... That note of optimism, that note of due recognition, what the opposition movement has been able to do. Because for many of us Zimbabwean watchers, we've often thrown our hands up in the, in the air in despair at the failures and the ineptitude and the internal struggles and at the corruption. So, um, um, that. so my question really is what next? Because there are still other players on the scene. What about Old Zapu, New Zapu? What about the Mujul faction and their many allies? Also, you know, you implied that the war veterans are a single group, but we know they are not. And, and actually, much of the politics of the last 20 years has been about the divisions within the war veteran group. And then finally, what about the... I'm not sure that the neoliberal kind of move is the same as a technocratic move. It wasn't that long ago that people were supporting, for example, the unity government, thinking as long as we get sort of non-partisan technocrats in like Simba Makoni, then we can get the state working again. So what's Simba Makoni and, and what about this kind of, because I don't think this technocratic group or if there is such a thing, is the same as a neoliberal group. I think there's something a little bit more bureaucratic, more civil servanty, at least that appeal is. What about those groups? That's kind of the problem. But I'll you were first. Thank you, Brian, and um, thank you, the Institute, for arranging this lecture. My name is Webster Chiangwa from the Embassy of Zimbabwe. I jo just thought it was necessary at some point for me to uh, bring in some few remarks on the table. But uh, firstly, to appreciate um, Brian's intervention. Um, just before we started the lecture, we just had a small chat and 
I told him that during my days at the University of Zimbabwe, I used to read uh, some of his literature on politics learned as a political science student. Thank you for that. But I just wanted to present a government narrative to all events that uh, happened in, in, in November and that climaxed uh, with the 15 November uh, events. Uh, firstly, the government narrative is that uh, the Zimbabwe Defense Forces had to intervene uh, through the Operation Restore Log Legacy in order to correct the situation uh, in the national security of the country. have different versions on what it was exactly. But the government narrative was, is that uh, it was not a military takeover. Uh, the military only initiated a process which was then taken over by the generality of the population, the party, and uh, finally the judiciary. So basically, all events were within the confines of the law uh, and um, the aim was basically to restore the legacy of uh, President Mugabe. So uh, one last point is that uh, these events um, were very uh, much embraced by the international community. There was no condemnation whatsoever. And, and that can tell you how legal and constitutional the process was. Um, so basically, what, what was therefore key was um, respecting the laws of the country through avoiding the provisions of the constitution and ancillary legislation. I just wanted to, to bring to the table that uh, government perspective of the events that uh, took place in November. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Thank you very much, Brian. My, my question flows uh, from what our friend here has spoken about. And it's about the role of in the politics of, uh, of, of Zimbabwe vis-a-vis -vis the, the masses, the popular masses. My assumption from your presentation is, uh, and from, from what we know from the press, is over time, uh, most of Zimbabwean population has been supporting the opposition and the government has uh, bullied its way into power in the elections that have passed 2008 and so on. Uh, so now that this military has, is, is, is obviously uh, the one in control and yet it's the same military that has uh, subjected people to suffering and brutality over time. I'm interested in your assessment of, of the kind of regime that is being generated here. Uh, do we essentially have a, a military regime like the one in Pakistan, uh, in Zimbabwe, or do we have a, a possibility of the popular masses uh, having a significant voice uh, those who are, I assume have been supporting the opposition over time, having a voice in the kind of regime that will evolve uh, in Zimbabwe, or do you think we will have this strong uh, military-backed uh, uh, regime in this country? Thank you. One of the things that uh, has been science is a clue. Like and that these these other groups themselves talking about different kind of lines. My sense that may be a real problem for ZANU. In terms of the support that we do in the It's just a few months. I can't get the historical data. 
there are probably many forty people, Danu people, who may well vote against Munangagwa next year. What effect that has will depend on what coordination is between the different opposition groups, particularly between MDCT and Matibirian and Kuwait. within the MDCT itself? Unless that is resolved, that's... So the opposition options that they can put on the table before the election and cause a real problem for Nangala. Especially if up to the elections things don't move in terms of the economy. So there's still no open space there for contestation. The technocrats new liberals. Look, I think that the difference between the technocratic bureaucracy and neoliberalism. Yes, the, the, that professionalism that in the public sector. However, much of the neoliberal discourse has been linked with Not only in Zimbabwe, on the continent as a whole. That technocracy, the, the, the technocracy is seen as driving an agenda which seems apolitical. And the language of neoliberalism is often cast in that mode. Well, in fact, it's a highly political intervention. But the very many cast is, is... And then when the World Bank and the IMF talk, they talk in the technocratic language of reducing public expenditure. Of 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 of, of uh, reforms around the land, reforms around doing ease of business. These are all major political decisions, but they cast in a technocratic language. And but the, I suspect the technocrats are doing within the regime in order to revive the Lima discussions on the Lima agreement, is to also cast their position as a technocratic one in order not to seem to be politicizing the economy, which is what they don't want to do, because they want to move away from the land of politics to the land of technocratic economic development. So that's the problem on that particular image. Uh, to restore the legacy, uh, yeah, I, I, maybe that's your position, it's fine. <laughs> I'll try to argue against it, but uh, I think that uh, we have to do what it is. The role of the military, uh, what happened to the masses? At the moment, the masses were, were a choreographed part of the coup in terms of their support on the day of the demonstration. They were allowed to demonstrate. That won't happen again. That won't happen again. They were allowed to demonstrate and the threat was always made to Mugabe if you can't resign. These people who will let them come to your house? Who will let them go to Stata? Who will let them go to the Blue Roof Mansion? It's all there was always that implicit threat to the demonstrations. And uh, you know, the, the Gaddafi effect was always in the air. What happens if these people come to my home? The, 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 the masses, in terms of their effect on the military for the moment, I would say is marginal. It's marginal. Unless it's in an organizational party form through a sustained electoral contest, there is so much sense of debilitation amongst the Zimbabwean population because of the impoverishment, the authoritarianism, the sense that we go to vote every five years. Our vote gets ignored. In 2008, we won the elections. They still didn't give power to the majority. We've done everything except pick up a, a, a weapon in Zimbabwe. We've had demonstrations, we've had general strikes, we've had stairways, we've created political parties that have fought elections, that have won elections, we've had massive international uh, uh, advocacy, nothing. What changed it was this military within ZANU-PF because they wanted a certain faction of ZANU-PF to rule. Not that they respect popular opinion or that they expect the sovereignty of popular vote. No. They've made it very clear 
that the mother is the whole rule of Zimbabwe. That is the what is happening in Zimbabwe. And that is something that is a very dangerous proposition for the future.